by asking a question. Have you ever, ever found yourselves in a, a deeply distressing situation, such as the, the loss, loss of a loved one, the, the loss of a job that you absolutely loved or that, you know, really provided, you know, for your family and or, or maybe the, the challenge of having to deal with an, a physical illness or, or maybe even a, a, an accident, only to have someone come to you and say something that at the time just seems so out of place and insensitive. Something like, cheer up, it's not the end of the world. Have you ever had that? You know, or, or cheer up and, and move on with your life. Or, or cheer up, God is with you, you'll be just fine. Or, or cheer up, things could have been much worse. H have you ever had that? And, you know, while you might have felt at the time, like saying to this person or, or telling this person where to go and how to get there, um... There's, there's just this one thing about scripture that, that we must come to recognize. And that is that one of the most repeated commands throughout all of scripture is this. Rejoice. Or, or in some instances we'll say be joyful or, or be of good cheer. This is one of the most repeated commands throughout all of scripture. And so today, we are going to explore one instance um, where we are commanded to rejoice as, as we see it in, in one of Paul's letters, um, in his letter to the, the church in, in Philippi. And so if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Which is where we are going to be be spending our our time this this morning. Here's what Paul says to the the Christians that that lived in in Philippi. I'm going to read from verses four to seven. He says, "Rejoice in the Lord always." Again, I say. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Dear Father, uh, we are grateful for the opportunity to continue to explore a portion of your word at this time. We ask that your spirit would enlighten us, dear Lord, that you would speak through me and, and that the words that come out of my mouth would be words from you uh, to your people. Be with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, though the, the command to rejoice is the most repeated command, um, it is not necessarily the most important command in, in Scripture. Um, in fact, we know that the most important commandment is what we see Jesus, Jesus saying in Matthew 23, uh, sorry, 22, uh, verses 37 to 40, where he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. 
And so the most important command is not necessarily to rejoice, but to love. And so as we explore this idea, this, this command of rejoicing, um, we will see how this, the most repeated command, relates to the most important um, command. Uh, throughout scripture, we see the words joy and rejoicing being used continually. In fact, the word rejoice shows up in the English Standard Version of the Bible about 233 times. And the word joy shows up another 200 times. And so together, this idea of joy and the expression of joy, uh, which is what rejoicing is, shows up a total of 433 times throughout Scripture. Now, the word love um, shows up almost twice as much as the word uh, joy and rejoicing. We see God instructing his people to express their joy in him in other ways such as praise, um, expressions of gratitude and worship, which are all expressions of joy in the Lord. These expressions of joy and rejoicing in the Lord surpasses uh, the, that of the word love many times over, and we cannot help but notice a significant amount of repetitions of this command uh, to rejoice. Uh, in this letter uh, to the Philippians, uh, we see the idea of joy and rejoicing showing up almost 20 times in this little letter, uh, with three of those instances being direct commands to rejoice, two of them in this passage that we are looking at today. Uh, Paul, in this specific passage, is inviting the Philippians uh, to experience an atmosphere of Christian joy and hopefulness, and he says that there are three things that makes this uh, makes obeying this command um, less difficult than it needs to be. And so, the first of these things that he says they must do, and that we must do, is rejoice. Rejoice. And, and, and he repeats this command here to add emphasis, emphasizing the importance of doing this, of rejoicing, which... I suppose would be the very reason why this command is repeated uh, so many times uh, throughout Scripture. I don't think he wants us to, to misunderstand or to take this command lightly, and so I, I gather that this is the reason for, for the repetition, um, not just in this letter, but, but throughout Scripture. Um, it is... It's very important to note, though, that the governing factor of this command is, is in the Lord. In the Lord. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Right? And so they're rejoicing. The, the Christians in Philippi uh, will not be possible any other way. Neither would our rejoicing be possible any other way. Joy, joy in, the, in the Christian life is in direct proportion to the believer's walk with, with the Lord. We can only rejoice when we have submitted ourselves to the will of God and are then considered to be in the Lord or, as Paul puts it, quite often in Christ. Joy is a fruit of, of a spirit-led, spirit-filled life. We see scripture showing us in Galatians 5 verse 22, telling us that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and, 
and that list goes on. But we see the first two things on that list as being the most important command and the most repeated command. And so when we deny ourselves the pleasure of God's presence in our lives, we deny ourselves the pleasure of experiencing not just the most repeated command in all of Scripture, but also the most important command of all Scripture. Now, while up to this point I've, I've basically looked at this text, uh, Philippians 4 verse 4, as a command from Paul to rejoice, and not as a simple word of encouragement, uh, we can also see this and all of this letter as an appeal, an appeal to faith being delivered to a church in distress uh, during difficult times. I, I really see Paul's heart here for these believers and that he, he longs for them to experience this very same joy that he is experiencing given his his situation and the situation that I'm talking about here is the fact that that Paul is sitting in a prison um, while he's writing this letter and he wants and, and even though he's in prison uncertain of what his future holds um, he is able to experience joy and so he wants the, the Christians in Philippi and us to experience the same joy. And so we see Paul pleading with them, saying in, in chapter 3, verse 1 of, of Philippians, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And then he encourages them by saying in, in, in chapter 4, verse 9, he says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things and the God of peace will be with you and so the fact that he is able to be joyful the fact that he is able to rejoice even though he is in the situation that he is in he longs for them to see that in him and practice likewise Even in the midst of, of our challenges, in the midst of, of the in uncertain times in which we live today, um, even in the midst of a world so full of chaos and corruption and, and so on, we too can rejoice in the Lord. We too can experience this peace from God which surpasses all understanding. We see Paul saying to, to the Christians in Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verses 16 to 18, he says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. And then he ends this, 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 this list of commands by saying, For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Here we see him appealing to them and to us today to rejoice ceaselessly, to, as, as we pray ceaselessly, being thankful ceaselessly. And if we do not consider the things that he, he, he tells us to think about, as we see listed in Philippians 4, 8, where he says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. If we don't do this, if we don't think about these things that, that Paul encourages us to think about, I, I don't believe 
that we will see any value in rejoicing. I don't believe that we will see any value in, in praying unceasingly or, or being grateful. And so we need to consider what it is that, that consumes our thoughts on a daily basis. What, what is it on our minds that prevent us from being joyful continually? What's burdening us that make us unable to ceaselessly rejoice? The second thing he tells the Philippians um, is to be gentle. Um, in, in the English Standard Version it says reasonable. In some other versions it says gracious. And so he's encouraging the Philippians to, to display gentleness, graciousness, reasonableness. And not just to, to their friends, not just to our friends, not just to those who are like us, not just to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but to everyone. Everyone. The idea here is that a genuine concern for the well-being of others over our own well-beings must be seen by everyone. In other words, others must be able to see the character of Jesus Christ in us. We see it being said in Titus 3, uh, verses 1 and 2, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. And so if we are to be faithful bearers of a witness unto Jesus Christ, this is how we must be seen. And not just individually, but, but also collectively as a united body of believers. I see this being portrayed perfectly in Acts chapter 2 verses 46 and 47 where it says about the early Christians, the, the early church, says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, which resulted in the Lord adding to their numbers day by day. Day, uh, those who were being saved. Everyone, everyone saw the early Christians as gracious, gentle, reasonable, selfless, kind, full of joy, and everyone wanted to share in that experience. Well, not everyone, but everyone who was who, who, who experienced the saving grace of, of Jesus Christ. They all wanted to be a part of this, this movement, this group of, of followers of Jesus Christ. The, the sad reality of today is that many of our churches are filled with people who have not truly experienced the joy of the Lord. Um, they have not acknowledged His graciousness and, are so, and so are unable to extend that same graciousness to others. And this really does extend from us being so caught up in ourselves, our struggles, our day-to-day -day challenges in life, our own concern for what the future may or may not hold for us, 
and even our own striving for our own salvation. Totally losing sight of the fact that God is near to us and that in his longing for us to experience genuine joy, he desires deeply for us to trust him and to love him wholeheartedly. And so Paul says, let everyone see your gentleness, your graciousness, your reasonableness, telling us that God is near and he longs to dispense upon each and every one of us the power that is needed in order to be a better reflection of him. He longs to give us his spirit, whereby the fruit of the spirit, the first two on the list being the most important commandment and the, repeat, the most repeated commandment, so that he may be glorified in us. Joy. Joy is the fruit of a right relationship with God. It is not something that we can create in our own efforts. In fact, the Bible distinguishes joy from pleasure. The Greek word uh, for pleasure uh, is the word from which we get the word hedonism, which is the, the philosophy of self-centered pleasure-seeking. Paul referred to the false teachers as lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. In fact, what he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, 3 verses 1 to 5 is this. He says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And then he says to, to Timothy, avoid such people. Avoid such people. The, the self-centeredness in our lives robs us of the joy Paul wishes for the, the Philippians and the Thessalonians and the early Christians to experience, thereby robbing them and us of the graciousness and reasonableness and the gentleness that everyone or to see in us. As I prepared this message and as I contemplated on, on, on this, this what Paul was, was saying to hear, it led me to, to pray like, like King David did in, in Psalm 51, where he says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. I pray today that this prayer will be yours also as you use opportunities that might come your way to reflect on your lives. The next thing that Paul says, we see it in Philippians 4 verse 6 where he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Our, our concern for ourselves and our situations often leads to us not being joyful and not being able to rejoice as well as leaving us not being able to extend the graciousness of God to those around us. Let me admit here to you today that I am a warrior, not, not like a soldier fighting warrior, but, but you know, a person who is, is sometimes overly overwhelmed with, with concern for myself, my family, sometimes for others around me. And while, while I, I, I don't worry nearly as much as I used to, years ago, it, it's still something I, I struggle with from time to time. I still worry unnecessarily from time to time. And oftentimes when I worry, it's, it's about the very things that we see Jesus saying to us in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew that we don't need to be worried about. And in fact, here's what he says in Matthew uh, 6, verses 31 to 34. He says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall I eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But he encourages us, saying, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things, all of these things that you have the tendency to be worried and overly concerned about, will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now when, when I, you know, I've taken time to consider what worrying is, and, and I've, I've come up with this, that, that worry is this overwhelming concern for our own well-being. Worrying sometimes can be synonymous with anxiety, and oftentimes we find that worrying, anxiety leads to what some may experience as an attack, right? So we hear people having anxiety attacks. Now when, when this happens, we find ourselves experiencing things that are contrary to what God invites us to experience in Him. Things like fear. Restlessness, sadness, a feeling of, of pressure or, or being hurried, concern for what may or may not happen in, in the future. And in contrast to these things, God invites us to experience and to demonstrate love that conquers all fear, rest in Him. Joy and rejoicing in Him, peace of mind, 
dependence upon him. One of my, my favorite people in scripture to, whose story I like to, to think about and, and reflect on every now and then is, is a story about Joshua. Joshua in, in Joshua chapter 1, um, we see him here being um, about to take charge, like he's, well, he has been given charge um, over the children of Israel, and he now has the responsibility of leading the children of Israel into the promised land. Moses has just died, and I am sure, I am pretty sure, pretty certain that Joshua is a little bit scared. You know, he has spent a significant amount of time with Moses and he has seen firsthand what the children of Israel are capable of. Right? And so I'm sure that Joshua is just a little bit concerned. However, we see God saying to him a few times, and even reiterating the command in verse 9 saying, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. However, prior to God saying this to Joshua, God told Joshua, he says, look, the, the words that I've given to Moses, the commands that I've given to Moses, you are to study those words. You are to study those commands continually and you are to meditate on them day and night. Day and night and continually meditating and studying the word of God. And this is why we see Paul saying to the, the Philippians, but in everything, by prayer and by supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Therefore saying to us, just like God said to Joshua, at all times we are to be in prayer, seeing prayer as an act of worship, and we are to call upon God with gratitude. In other words, be in constant communion with God. It is said in Psalm 145 verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. And we see Paul adding, when you do this, when you seek God wholeheartedly, and when you are in constant commun communion with him, you too will experience relief from your worrying. This is the antidote to our anxiousness. Our, our recalling, our continual recalling of God's goodness and mercy will save us from the many pitfalls which await our sometimes ungrateful souls. Such pitfalls as being overly concerned with our immediate problems, forgetfulness of God's gracious dealings with us in the past, disregard of the needs of others who are less fortunate than we are. As I mentioned to you earlier, and I like how Paul offers the same command to the, the Christians in Thessalonica, where he says, rejoice always, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, without ceasing, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this 
is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It is God's will. It is God's will for you and for me that we may be able to rejoice in Him always. This is God's will for you. And in our ability to rejoice in Him always, we find ourselves being able to extend the graciousness that we have experienced from Him to those around us, therefore bearing witness of Him and being a, 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 a worthy reflection, being a reflection of Him to all of the world. This is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. And He does not want us to forget this. So He appeals to us to be in constant communion with our Savior. And this is what will guard our hearts and our minds keeping our hearts and our minds in tune with our Heavenly Father, in tune with the will of God. The Hebrew people um, had been brought out of, of Egypt after having witnessed ten, ten miraculous plagues over the Egyptian people and the, the land of Egypt, they had experienced the parting of the Red Sea and, and the presence of God with them in the, the form of a, a cloud by day and, and a pillar of fire by night. The Hebrew people saw God providing for their every need while keeping them safe from their enemies and granting them victory in battle against the enemies when they were called upon to fight. The Lord had told them, as we see in, in Deuteronomy 1, uh, verses 30 and 31, The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet, yet they refused. They refused to enter the promised land because of their total lack of gratitude for all that God had done for them, for all they had seen from God, as well as their lack of trust in Him. Now, this resulted in that whole generation of Hebrews being denied the opportunity to enter the promised land, except for two whose hearts and minds were stayed upon God and, and his goodness uh, to them. And these two men were Caleb and Joshua. These two men were two out of twelve spies sent to check out the land before the, the children of Israel um, would have been allowed to proceed um, to enter it. Even though that, that wasn't necessarily called for because God had already said to them, I will go before you and I will fight for you. But anyway, they, they saw it necessary to send spies into the land. Again, probably rising out of their distrust, their lack of trust in God. And so these two men were two out of 12 spies, the only two out of the 12 spies that came back, that, that believed in God and, and what he had said and brought back positive report, optimistic report of the possibilities of entering into the promised land. We, we have been 
enduring some truly uncertain times in our world these days. But our God has promised to go before us, to prepare mansions for us in His heavenly kingdom. He has promised that He will be with us until the end of the age, never leaving us or forsaking us. He promised us an advocate, a comforter, a helper, by which we will have power to be transformed into the image of Christ, bearing witness of Him to all the world. He promised us that though we go through dark valleys, that He is there with us and that He will be near to those of us that call upon Him. He promised us that while life on earth might be filled with weeping and sorrow and pain and sadness, that joy comes in the morning. He promised us that He has good plans for each and every one of us to give us a future and a hope. A, a future full of ceaseless rejoicing as we continually consider His never-ending love. So, my brothers and sisters, will, will we today allow ourselves to be indifferent towards the promises of God and all that He has done for us up to this point in our lives? Or, or, or will we choose from this day forward to be more intentional in communing with Him more regularly, recognizing that this is the only way we will grow into ceaselessly rejoicing in Him. Dear Gracious Father, we are so grateful, dear Lord, for what you have made possible for us. Because we know, dear Lord, that there is no way in our own strength, in our own understanding, in our own abilities to be at a place where we are able to rejoice ceaselessly. This is only possible through you, dear God. And you have made it clear to us that this is your will for us. And so, as we reflect on this, dear Lord, I pray, dear Father, that you would help us see the areas in our lives, dear Lord, that are hindering us from being where it is your will for us to be. And I pray, dear Father, that as we see these things, that we would surrender them totally and wholeheartedly to you, making you, giving you that place in our lives that makes, us, makes it possible for us to experience ceaseless rejoicing. Continue to abide with us now as we abide in you is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior.